All right, well, it's 10 a.m., so we're going to get started here. Uh, my name is Lauren Dow, uh, and I have a few updates from the NWRA that I'm going to share. First off, uh, I want to thank everybody who helped out with TRB and um, who was there and helped at our booth. Um, and we had a number of people who helped uh, get the booth set up, and uh, I just the payment workshop registration is live and uh, it can be found on our website uh, if you go to the main and the right page and then you can choose the payment workshop on the right hand side you will find how to get to the registration there. The agenda that we have so far is posted, but it is still in process. Um, so we will have more updates as we move forward to meetings. And we also have a booth at uh, Geo Congress coming up at the end of February, and that is happening here in Minneapolis. Um, so if you are around our attending, uh, we'll probably be setting up some more signups for people to help with that booth as well. Today we have um, a few different presentations on the spread on the Jupiter. First off, we have a synthesis from um, WSB and Andrea Blanchett, Stonewood, and Shu We were all part of um, putting that synthesis together. And Shu is here today to uh, present on the synthesis overall. Uh, and one quick reminder to those online to make sure you're muted. And then to those in the room that the microphones above you will pick up uh, anything else uh, happening. So uh, please go ahead and of that. So Shu Lee is here today. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Minnesota and a degree in civil engineering. She took her internship here at the Linda office and um, was loved by many I've heard because that was before my my time here. Um, but we were very um, sad to see her leave our office, but I'm excited about what she's doing at the USB. And um, so I will just turn it over to Shu. And today I'm going to present on the Square Back University the that will appear for the end of our recurring community. So first we'll take a look at what the Square Back University is. And next we'll move on to the findings from the literature review. And then we'll talk about the next steps in this project. So what is a Square Back as often we know, even ages over time due to oxidation and gradually. So spiral regulators are applied to the treatment surface as the cost effective method to reverse the effects of aging. They are often applied to root mix that are in the pollution to serve as a cost effective method and also as a pyramid making treatment. So in order to understand how the square measurement works, we have to learn about the components of asphalt. There are two main components of asphalt, which are asphaltines and mountains. Asphaltines are hard, brittle, and insoluble, which furnish the binder structure, while mountains are volatile in nature. Okay. So while uh, mountains are volatile in nature, and they are responsible for maintaining the adhesion and flexibility properties of the binder. So using adsorption chromatography, mountains can be further fractured into four distinguishable sub-fragments, okay. which are the polar compounds, saturated hydrocarbons, first acidophines, and second acidophines. So there are two major types of 
retrometers, which are the petroleum-based retrometers, and the bio-based retrometers. So first, let's take a look at the petroleum-based retrometers. Volatilization happens during manufacturing and oxidation occurs in the fuel. During these processes, assaulting content increases, while the melting content decreases. As I mentioned in the slide earlier, Maltines are responsible for maintaining the flexibility and adhesion properties of the binder. So, in order to restore these properties, we have to restore the melting content. So, petroleum based regulators are applied to rebalance the ratio of maltines to asphaltines. As for bio based regulators, they are environmental friendly and they do not contain maltines. They are sourced from different natural ingredients, which can be from soybeans, oranges, corn, and other plant-based products. Bio-based regulators are intended to provide similar regulating effects as the petroleum-based regulators. The chemical compositions of bio-based regulators they are often not known because they are considered as a trade secret. So the objective of this synthesis is to guide the research needs statement for the upcoming research project on test sections investigating the type of regulating products, laboratory and performance testing, friction values, and pavement marking reflecting. <coughs> Survey was sent to all the NWR member states to collect their responses on the experience using different types of spirit on measurements. So the products listed on these few slides were based on survey responses collected. For petroleum-based regulators, the member states have experience testing, CMS1 pH, CLF restorative seal, GSD88, PES GP, Thermocheck, Levermind, Fusion X, and Regular Seal. And for bio-based regulators, the member states have tested Anoa, BioRestore, Delta Mist, and Replay. There were a few lab and performance testing that we have collected and summarized from the literature review. So there are six different testing conducted, which were done with shear neurometer, photo transformed infrared spectroscopy, bending beam neurometer, chemical compositions, friction, and retroreflective. So first, let's take a look at dynamic shear rheometer testing. Dynamic shear rheometer test can be conducted on binders extracted to obtain the complex modulus or the stiffness method. Dynamic crit testing can be conducted on mixture to evaluate if the rheometers have penetrated into the pavement surface and blended with the binder. Photo transform infrared spectroscopy is used to compare the spectrum with spectra of known compounds and also to determine if the profiles match. This test is used to compare the peaks with location of known functional groups. As you can see in the figure on the right, carbonyl and sulfoxide functional groups have different peaks. Based on a different synthesis that we have conducted, which is the mixed residue synthesis, we have found out that a few institutions have compared the peaks of functional group to determine the degree of oxidation. These few studies have seen a reduction in carbonyl and sulfoxide functional group in regenerated binders as compared to binders without regenerators. So this proves that the regenerators are indeed effective in reducing the degree of oxidation of each binder. And next we'll talk about bending beam neurometer. Bending beam reometer testing can be conducted on mixture to obtain the stiffness value and the end value, which is the changes in the low temperature phase angle. Bending beam reometer can be used to determine the effectiveness of regenerators at providing or restoring the low temperature characteristics. Chemical compositions can be obtained using the modified ESP standard. C2006, which is the determination of chemical components in asphalt and non-asphalt regulators. The table below shows the requirements obtained from the ASTM standard, which shows the requirements for viscosity, multi-in distribution ratio, and the allowable percentage of asphalt. 
Friction values can be obtained using dynamic friction tester, speed trailer, or circular track meter. Friction testing is used to determine the recovery of friction to acceptable friction values or friction values prior to the treatment applied. Retroreflectivity measures the amount of light reflected from the test surface for a given amount of applied illuminance. This test can be performed using pavement marking reflectometer. The table on the right shows the requirements obtained from the NIMBA specification 2582. The table shows the pavement marking retroreflectivity requirements based on different types of material used. And next, we'll move on to the results of the studies that we have found. One of the studies was from the National Center for Asphalt Technology. In this study, the application rate of each product was as recommended and specified by the manufacturer. The table on the right shows the classification of product performance. The performance was ranked in a way that greatly represents the best performing products. There are two criteria we investigated, which were the rheological properties and the friction test results. So the rheological properties were obtained in accordance with the Federal Aviation Administration specifications, while the friction were obtained from the friction tester. As you can see in the table on the right, fire discharge and replay were classified as grade A, region X, Catalyst and Regomite were classified as grade B. CMS1 pH gradual seal were classified as CSC. Next, we'll move on to the study conducted by Missouri Department of Transportation. Missouri DOT conducted two different testings, which were chemical compositions and friction testing. There are four products being investigated, which were Virostore, Regomite, Rheochite, and Sierra. Similar to the MCAT study, the application rate of each product was as recommended and specified by the manufacturer. The table on the lower left shows the requirements for chemical compositions as obtained from the ASTM standard. And the figure on the right shows the results of the testing from chemical compositions. So fire withdrawal, rental light, and CRF fulfill the criteria for the percentage of asphalt based allowed. And only CRF will build the criteria for market distribution ratio. But here I'd like to point out that since BioRestore is a bio-based product, the market distribution ratio is not applicable to this product. Another testing conducted by Missouri DOT was friction testing. BioRestore and Rapamide produced satisfactory friction results after two months of application. So overall, in the Missouri study, <laughs> Biorestore and Rapamide fulfill the criteria for both allowable percentage of asphalt and recovered friction values. The Minnesota Department of Transportation has also conducted a study using two different products, which were Biorestore and Replay on pavement shoulder. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy was used to determine the profile of each product. Since BioRestore and Replay were both bio-based products, they generated similar profiles as you can see in the figures on the right. However, when they were compared to another type of product, which is an asphalt motion, the profiles were different as you can see here on the right. Another testing conducted by Minda was friction testing. Shoulder generally receives meter traffic, so the recovery of friction would be based on the product performance and the environmental exposure. Both BioRestore and Replay had friction recovery similar to the control section after one year of application. Another testing conducted by Linda was retroreflectivity. So full recovery of retroreflectivity would occur as the reflective surfaces became exposed by traffic weather. Both BioRestore and Replay showed similar recovery of retroreflectivity, which approximately 1,600 truck passes were required to recover the retroreflectivity values to those prior to the treatment. The Federal Highway Administration has also conducted a study using different types of regimen. 
one of the testing we conducted was friction testing using dynamic friction tester and circular texture meter. The results showed that Redomine had a higher friction value as compared to test TV. Dynamic shear regular testing was also conducted on binders extracted to obtain the complex modules value, and dynamic trip testing was conducted on mixture. The results showed that Redominator softened the paper surface, with Redomine showed the greater softening of all. Vending beam regulator testing was conducted to evaluate the effectiveness of regulators at providing or restoring the low temperature characteristics. The results showed that Redomine reduced the low temperature stiffness as compared to the control. Next, we'll talk about the field evaluation conducted by Natural National. Redomine and has produced satisfactory results. So these two products have been adopted into the paper preservation program. Regular seal had a strong odor smell, so it would create concerns, especially when applied on residential streets. GSD 88 took a lot of a time to cure, and together with Replay, these two products have been under the preservation of Tennessee DOT and the Metro. So to summarize the product performance for bio-based products, bio and replay produce satisfactory results in friction, retro reflectivity, and binder biology. As for petroleum-based product, recommend show satisfactory results in the allowable percentage of asphaltines, friction testing, and softening of age asphalt. Here I'd like to emphasize that the product performance was based on the literature sources found, and other products that are not listed here doesn't mean that they are not performing as well, but they might not be as widely used or tested as compared to the three products listed here. I'd like to talk a little bit on specifications. Each regulator performs differently, so it is not recommended to specify the application rates based on the literature sources we found, but it is ultimately up to the agency to make decision on that. There are a few available specifications, which are from the Federal Aviation Administration, the Florida Pavement Preservation Council, and the Maryland State Highway Administration. These few specifications cover requirements such as material type, repair binder, friction requirements, general construction requirements, and will be candidates. And last, I'd like to talk about the next steps in this project. So for the upcoming research projects on the NWRI test sections, the member states would have to discuss on what type of products to be used on the test sections, the location of test cells, and what, to determine what type of lab testing and field performance testing to be conducted on the test sections. And last, I'd like to thank all the NWRI member states for participating in this project. And we'll open up for any questions here. What was the age in some of the research projects you were highlighting? What was the original payment age, or how long had it been after construction? So for the Missouri QOT, I believe the payment age is about like a year. And then for the Federal Highway Administration, the payment age is about like two years. And then for the Federal Highway Administration, the some year applied like in 2001 to 2006, but the study was conducted in 2008, so that might be a few years before. All right, thank you, Shu. Um, yep, here I'll pass it on to Michael Lewis. So for the remainder of today's research phase off, I will be talking about uh, what the uh, NWRA flex team did on front highway six. So the whole intention of today's uh, research phase off 
is to have Shu kind of introduce what this uh, spray spray on synthesis for the PM team, um, as they will be looking to do a field sec to do field sections uh, this upcoming construction season in 2020. So the work that Shu and Andrea and WSP just presented on is the background for uh, our upcoming field sections for the spray rejuvenators. Um, so that kind of provides us with what kind of challenges we're facing, what type of projects we can look for, um, where we can apply these, and then the testing that we need to do to evaluate the spray on rejuvenators. Um, I'm going to be presenting on what we did last construction season under the flexible team with mixed rejuvenators. Uh, we kind of see the spray rejuvenator projects following a similar kind of model that we used uh, for the mixed rejuvenators. Um, that worked out well for everyone involved. So before I get started into the actual project description and the products that were used and all the details, uh, I need to acknowledge everybody that was involved with this project. Uh, there was a lot of different people and groups that interacted and the whole project relied on every one of these groups and individuals. Any one of them could have said no and the whole thing would have been shut down. Um, it started as an idea um, from the NWRA Flex team and the TAP members that were assigned to this project or volunteered for this project provided a lot of input throughout this TAP. It was made up of agency representatives from the different member agencies, um, producers from different rejuvenator producers, also academia. There was a couple um, key academia figures that kind of helped steer and guide us as well. Um, and then just general industry um, contractors as well. So thank you to all the TAP members. Uh, so once we had the kind of the idea in the TAP, I approached John Garrity in MnDOT's Petuminous office about this time last year, one year ago, and asked if this was even possible. Um, and John helped uh, started finding, helped us start finding projects, um, contacting individual districts, something that would fit everybody's needs. Um, and we settled on a project in MnDOT District 3. District 3 was influential throughout the project from the onset of providing us the roadway that we did this research on. Uh, but also um, the lead up and the logistics with the contractor as well in the contract. Um, during construction with their field inspectors helping take samples, coring, that kind of stuff. Um, setting up the test sections, taking GPS coordinates for us. Uh, and then the contractor themselves, they were Anderson Brothers out of Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, once we had a project that we needed to, we needed the contractor to buy in this project. The contractor, the contract was already awarded to Anderson Brothers. Um, so it was really up to Anderson Brothers whether they were going to allow this on their project. Um, they calculated some of the delays that incorporating these rejuvenators would cost, some plant upgrades. Um, and we said we would be able to offset the cost of that and we were able to move forward with Anderson Brothers um, and the knowledge that Anderson Brothers had um, and expertise of their own plant um, construction operations made this project go very smoothly. Uh, and then I'll get to the full list of producers and suppliers, uh, but each one of them had a representative on site during construction that was helpful getting dosage and ensuring that we had, we were putting down a product and a section um, that each company would stand behind and was happy with. Um, and then MnDOT research staff, Ben Worrell and Dr. Raul Velasquez, I'll get to their roles a little bit later, um, but just kind of facilitating and especially being on site during construction. So a little bit of background um, from the mixed rejuvenator side of things, very similar to what Shu covered with the spray on rejuvenators. Um, but rejuvenators are an emerging technology in uh, asphalt. The intent of a rejuvenator is to kind of minimize oxidation in a mixed rejuvenator. It allows you to uh, increase the recycled content in your mix. And right now, um, there's a lot of different producers, a lot of sources, um, and then a lot of uh, sales representatives or people that are um, at contacting us as an agency trying to use their product. Um, there's a decent amount of research out there, especially new research on these rejuvenators, 
but a lot of it is laboratory based and in the opinion of the NRA Flex team, we felt like there wasn't a lot of field research where we could say, okay, this product has been used, it's been in place, and it has this documented performance. So that's kind of the niche that we wanted to fill with this was get some field test sections and um, our MnDOT research group, we could utilize some of the tools we have for MnRO and really provide that long-term performance. Uh, so the questions we were trying to answer with this project, um, one, can these rejuvenators be incorporated successfully uh, without impacting the construction project? Can they be added in the plan? Uh, is there any safety concerns or anything like that um, during the construction pro process? Um, and then two, like I just emphasized, just the field performance. How well do these do when they're built on a real project, open to real traffic, exposed to the elements? Um, and then more the laboratory and mixed performance testing side of things. Uh, so we have the field performance. Let's also do the laboratory performance side of things um, and see both testing the mix and the binder. What changes are we noticing from these individual products and how long do those changes last in our asphalt? So with John Gary's help and MnDOT District 3, we found a project in, I call it North Central Minnesota, but it's in Emily, Minnesota. It's on Trunk Highway 6. The, uh, the existing pavement structure, it was pretty consistent. It was a 13 mile stretch of project, uh, the whole job. Um, and the pavement condition was consistent throughout uh, where it had some wheel path cracking, um, as well as pretty regular transverse tracks it was, a, it was five inches thick asphalt, um, and the project was a two-inch mill and fill with an inch and a half uh, wear course on top of that. Uh, so really, it was getting uh, three and a half inches of new mix for a, a new pavement structure of six and a half inches of asphalt. All of our rejuvenator sections were placed in the southbound direction uh, just to keep consistent traffic over um, the experiment sections. So coordination, like I mentioned earlier, this um, whole project was developed after the original contract uh, was let and awarded. Um, so this was done with no additional cost to MnDOT um, or the NRA. The rejuvenator suppliers themselves paid Anderson Brothers directly to offset the cost of the construction delays as well as Anderson Brothers needed an uh, upgrade of a, a pump upgrade to blend the rejuvenators at the plant um, at some of the higher rates that these products needed. Um, the NRA state agencies will be doing the mixture testing on these sections. Uh, I'll talk about what tests are being conducted and who's doing them, but that we're all kind of sharing the work and awaiting the results from everyone else's work. Uh, and then there's also a long-term uh, research component to this to analyze the field performance as well as do some additional binder testing. Um, and that is currently in the RFP process. Uh, so the RFP is still open. Um, it closes, I believe, the 3rd of February. Um, and we've gotten a lot of interest in that. Um, and it's available uh, online if you're interested in finding that RFP. So the field sections. We ended up with a total of 10 field sections, seven different uh, rejuvenator products. Um, there was Cargill with Anova, Poet with Jive, the US Soybean Board with a SESO or sub epoxidized soybean oil, uh, Ingevity with Evoflex, Craton with Silver Road, Asphalt and Wax Innovations with Pave Save. Georgia Pacific with Tough Trek. Uh, and then we had three control sections, one being a 30% wrap control, which was used as the surface mix for the remainder of the project. Um, and then two for each day of construction with the higher wrap content that we bumped up to, with, to incorporate the rejuvenators. So we have a control section each day of construction that we had a, with the rejuvenator. Uh, I need to emphasize that this project is not a direct comparison or ranking of the individual performance of one uh, producer to the other, but an overall comparison of each one to the control. Um, in the NRA's, uh, 
opinion, if we had it our way, all of these sections would perform really well and we're able to kind of advance the industry and the state of practice uh, with rejuvenators and recycled products. So we're not really trying to say one is better than the other. We're trying to say this product was used here and it worked well. Um, I'm showing this picture again that was on my title slide, but it really kind of emphasizes the different products that we have visually. So you can see um, six out of the seven products arrived in totes and they were blended in line um, at the hot mix plant, similar to kind of a warm mix additive. Uh, but in this picture, you can see all the different colors of totes. So there's uh, rejuvenators in this experiment that are soybean based. There's rejuvenators that are corn based. There's rejuvenators um, that are pine based. And you can kind of see the contrast in the colors, but also one of the things that I wasn't expecting that really we relied on Anderson Brothers, each one had a slightly different viscosity. So at the plant, Anderson Brothers had to tweak their plant and the pump to be able to handle that. Uh, we also had Dr. Raul Velasquez from our research team here at MnDOT. He was uh, at the plant working with each contractor, with each producer representative, as well as with Anderson Brothers, um, documenting everything that was done at the plant, but also kind of smoothing things over uh, with what the producer was asking to what the contractor could actually do. So dosage targets for the rejuvenator. Um, so the project itself, the remainder, or it was originally let, had 30% wrap. We bumped that wrap content up to 40% for the rejuvenator sections just to get more recycled content in there. Um, but we also were pretty aggressive uh, with the target that we chose uh, for the dosage. Um, and this was really a decision that was um, guided by the flex team cap group that really uh, we relied heavily on the experts in there. Um, with a lot of the feedback we were getting from some of the national research or NCHRP research was that these rejuvenators are beneficial, but they're being underdosed. So we wanted to try to be on the higher dosage uh, side of things. So the project had a 58S minus 28 binder. Um, and that is because it is an overlay project. Uh, that is the standard binder that MnDOT uses. But if you actually look at LTP bind and the location of this project and the recommendation that that provides, um, a minus 34 is called for or even a minus 40 at the higher reliability. Um, our wrap grade was fairly good, uh, at PG 75 minus 23. Uh, so we decided to shoot for a minus 34 target um, with the rejuvenators, um, which isn't typical when you're using a minus 28 binder. So when you're using typically how it would be done, um, you would be using the rejuvenator to take you from the wrap grade to the virgin binder grade. Uh, but with this project and the climate conditions and us wanting that higher dosage, uh, we decided to go for the minus 34 um, target. So what we did was we told the rejuvenator producers, you need to dose your product to meet that target um, from plant produced uh, PAV age samples. So we didn't have, we supplied the rejuvenator producers with some wrap and some virgin binder. And within two or three weeks, they had to turn around and give us a dosage to be used during construction. So during construction, construction occurred August 28th and 29th of 2019. Um, I'm happy to report that with everybody's uh, involvement and participation and help and good attitudes, we had no major issues during construction. Um, all suppliers were happy with their sections. Anderson Brothers was um, happy and wasn't too irritated to incorporate all of these. Um, we did get a lot of help uh, from Anderson Brothers and Mike Deamey. Uh, who's their uh, project manager, him overseeing the project, but even just their field crew guys helping us take samples and filling buckets and the paving crew. Um, I can't say enough good things about Anderson Brothers. Uh, and again, this is where Ben Worrell and Raul Velasquez come in. We filled over 300 buckets of hot mix samples between Ben, Raul, and myself. Uh, so we had at least 30 buckets per test section 
Um, and we also collected some of the raw materials as well. Um, and then we are distributing those buckets to NWRA state agencies. MnDOT is going to be doing DCT and Amber. Illinois is going to be doing IFIT testing and some additional binder testing as well. Uh, Missouri is going to be doing the PSR and Wisconsin is going to be doing IDEAL. So since construction, um, we've started on some of the initial lab work. MnDOT has taken um, the maximum GMM from each of these, so we can send out for the mixed testing, um, kind of give everybody a starting point so they can start building the performance test samples. Uh, cores were taken immediately after construction, one day after, and then we went back, uh, MnDOT research team went back six weeks later and took cores for future comparison to see if there's any um, early on changes um, from the rejuvenators. If we had a rejuvenator that gave us good properties initially after construction and was gone six weeks later. Um, as I mentioned previously, the RFP is currently open. Uh, we've gotten a lot of interest nationally uh, regarding the RFP. And we're excited uh, to be able to go through that process and award the research. Riot has been measured, so we have a uh, Pathways digital inspection vehicle, and we've taken ride measurements on these projects or on these sections twice this fall, and we plan on doing it um, again throughout the warmer weather um, once we get to spring and once we get out uh, our vans out and start collecting again. We've established 500 foot test sections. Um, so each one of these uh, sections was built anywhere from 1,200 feet to over half a mile in length. And that was just done based off of the plant. So we had Raul and the product representative at the plant. And so they start making this mix. And once they get everything dialed in and fine-tuned at the plant, that's where we started. They sent us a message, okay, we're looking at truck number 20 is where we want to start. So we started collecting. Um, once truck number 20, we got our samples. We established that's where the field section would start, just to ensure that we were getting kind of the any tweaks or variations uh, out and that the producers could really be happy and with the mix that was being collected and then going to be evaluated long term. Um, and then MnDOT research staff will continue to monitor, ride, and take course on these. So again, just recognizing um, the parent companies of each one of the producers, so Craycon, Cargill, Ingevity, Poet, Georgia Pacific, United Soybean Board, <coughs> and Asphalt and Wax Innovations. Uh, another thing to highlight about these companies is that they're based all over the U.S. So um, as you can see, uh, Georgia Pacific, obviously they're out of Georgia, um, but Cargill in Minnesota, Poet is South Dakota, Ingevity is in the Carolinas, um, Asphalt and Wax is in Mississippi, uh, Soybean Board is in Iowa. Um, so really kind of using the NRRA's national footprint to get a lot of involvement and awareness in this project. Uh, just again, highlighting everybody that was involved. I'm not going to go through individually again, um, but really, this isn't my project. This is everybody's project in the NRRA Flex team that really kind of facilitated this. And in my personal opinion, that's really the benefit of the NRRA and the uniqueness of it is being able to bring all of these different groups and people to the table and have an actual experiment where the suppliers and the producers have a voice in how the research is, um, just as much as some of the future potential researchers are kind of giving guidance to, okay, you need to be aware of this during construction, you need to watch out for this variable, that kind of thing. Um, getting everybody at the same table instead of just one group doing it within their silo uh, was really beneficial at the end of our day. So with that, um, I'll open it up to questions um, for either myself or for Shu and WSB. Mike, with the uh, 
higher rejuvenator dosing rates, did you notice any um, tenderness issues during placement and compaction um, as compared to the control sections? Was there any, any difference in um, placement and compaction? No, and that's one of the things, uh, so when we were taking samples, we were working pretty closely with the paving crew or just in the same general area as they were, and they did not change any of their rolling or compaction patterns for any of the products. Um, they weren't planning on it and they didn't feel the need to. Um, and really, there wasn't a lot of noticeable difference in the mix themselves. Um, Speaking from watching the paper, but also from physically shoveling the mix into buckets, we couldn't see one mix was softer or more tender than the others. Um, the only thing, and we kept, we also were asking the paving crew, did you guys notice we changed mixes? Did you notice this? And there was only one section that they said it had a pine smell, um, but it wasn't like it was overwhelming or nauseous or anything like that. So, um, in general, no, no real differences during construction work there. And, and similar, the same densities between control and uh, um, the different uh, rejuvenator sections? Yeah, nothing was um, abnormally more dense and nothing was um, abnormally less dense. It uh, was all within uh, one or two percent of the target density and I think just normal construction variation. So yeah. good presentation. Uh, was it an IC job, I assume? I don't think so. No. Why did we meet volume requirements? Or? Not to put you on the spot. I don't know the length of the project. <laughs> okay. you know I don't know the length of the project. <laughs> yeah, the length is 30 miles. So I'm not sure why it wasn't on there. How about do we do GPR at all? Um, I thought we'd do a 3D rate on that. I'm not sure if we did prior to construction, but I think yeah, I was planning on going up there in the future. So what what was the density? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, um, but 92 to 93 percent. 92 would have been the spec minimum, so I would guess right around there. But the majority of these not be all the same. not even the same. No. Yeah. Did any of those products replace binder, or, or did all the binder percentages stay the same from section to section? Um, some of them. So we left the dosage up to the plant and that we haven't actually done our burnout tests or that hasn't, testing hasn't been done. Uh, but some of them are advertised as binder replacements where some of them are marketed as addition to the binder. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question for Kurt Dunn, Kurt Dunn from the North Dakota DOT. Uh, with, with, with the 50% wrap, uh, was it, uh, did you have to run the material a little hotter, the, the virgin aggregates and things? No, um, plant temperature, so we left the control, we weren't dictating how the plant operated, so the mixing temperature of the job was 280. Um, and they stayed there and actually one of the products and thanks Kurt for reminding me of this the Ingevity product product They actually ran at warm mix temperatures. They were down uh, around 240 for that product um, They said that they would prefer if it was ran at warm mix temperatures and the plant was able to accommodate that um, so Temperature stayed consistent um, for each section, so we didn't have to really overheat, and it was 40% rack was our higher rack content. Okay, thanks. All right.
Perfect. Uh, so if there's any other questions or you think of something later, uh, feel free to email me or Shu. Um, and we'll get your question answered. Today's presentation, like all of the other research pays off, will be posted on the NWRA website. Um, encourage everyone to go look at that. And also, um, the report that Shu presented on this morning is also under the PM team's page. Um, and there's some pretty good information in there uh, summarizing everything that she talked about today. With that, I hope everyone has a good morning and thanks for joining us.